Hello and welcome back to the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. My name is... Still Mike Ashmore. Still, 21 episodes in, that hasn't changed. I'm still Mike Ashmore. Oh, this one's so good. So sometimes when I do these... Let's just be honest here. Sometimes when I do these, I struggle to pick a preview clip. I'm like, oh man, I don't really know what I have here. There were like 12 I could have gone with in this one. It's a it's a chat with George Contos, two-time World Series champion, a guy I've known for a very long time, both in Trenton and in his very brief stay with Long Island last year. We kind of reconnected a little bit. Um, man, this was so fun. I know it's a long one. It's probably about an hour and a half long. Uh, please stick with it. I promise, promise, promise it's worth it. It's a great chat, uh, Chicago native. So I had to shoot my had to shoot my intro video in front of MJ there, but um, such a, a good fun chat. I can't wait for you guys to to listen to it. So without further ado, here it is: the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast featuring George Contos. All right, guys, welcome back to the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast. My next guest, I first came across this guy in my first full year in Trenton. Uh, he was a, a young prospect coming up with the Yankees, and now he is a two-time World Series champion and, of course, a former Long Island Duck. As you all obviously remember him as, George Contos, welcome to the pod, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to have you on, man. I know we're going to get to into the uh, the greatest two weeks of your career there, um, but there, there, there's so many places to get to. But I guess first, just uh, how's everything been going lately? Everything's been going well. You know, uh, all things considered, it's, uh, you know, been able to keep myself busy once this whole uh, quarantine started. I went and bought myself some books because I knew I was going to get tired of watching TV with no sports. Um, so I've been doing some reading and working out as, as much as I can and trying to just uh, fill my time. So what uh, what are you reading these days? Um, so when, when the when the quarantine started, I bought I went and bought eighteen books, and I've gotten through five or six of them. But uh, the ones that stick out in my head so far that I've read are uh, the Malcolm Gladwell books. I've I've read um, uh, the, the one I'm reading right now is called The Tipping Point, and then I read Outliers, and I still have um, Blink, which is his third novel um, to read when I'm done. Um, but th- those two, um, have been really, really good. And there's another book called, uh, the subtle art of not giving a blank. And <laughs> I really, really, I really, really enjoyed that one. That one was probably my favorite book so far. It really, uh, offers a different perspective on situations that everybody inevitably comes through in life. And I really enjoyed it. Any reason you kind of chose to get into his books or, um, just over the years scrolling through Instagram and just seeing, um, you know, people who have done very, very well in their lives and just reading lists that they recommended and some of the same books kept popping up. So I just ordered all of them. And there's just this great, there's this great half price bookstore uh, right by my parents' house where people kind of donate their books back and you can get $30 hardcovers for like four ninety nine. So I just went, went there and splurged and uh, came back with a little library. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. That's good to see you're keeping yourself busy in these, these crazy times. The, uh, I guess we got to talk a little baseball, too. Uh, the, the pride of Niles West High School in Skokie, Illinois. Um, baseball player of the year in 03, lettered in golf and basketball, but I saw you hit 480 as a senior, too. Or was, there ever, was there ever a thought of, of sticking to, I think you were an outfielder back then, is that right? I was a third baseman, actually. Third so baseman, I was, okay. Yeah, I was a two-way player in high school, and... Um, when I went to college, when I got, when I got my scholarship to Northwestern, initially the coach at the time, um, who's not there anymore, but at the time they said that I could be a two way player and I got there and, uh, I was, I was throwing my bullpens and pitching in fall ball. And then I was also doing my reps at third base and the, the pitching kind of, you know, kept, um, kind of gradually increasing my velocity. I was getting bigger and stronger. I started throwing a little bit harder and they were basically like, look, you're not going to be really playing that much in the field you're going to be our our one of our weekend starters so we'd, we'd like you to focus on um on just pitching and uh they gave me two at bats that season and i went one for two with a, a bloop single over second base so that was my that was my collegiate career hitting but in, in high school i could hit a little bit you know the, the guys uh would always throw fastballs or breaking balls weren't as good as guys in college but um i held my own in high school was it always going to be baseball for you? Because I know you lettered in golf. Golf's always been a big thing for you, like we were kind of informally talking about earlier. Basketball as well. Was it always going to be baseball? 
Yeah, I think it was always going to be going to be baseball. I mean, uh, I, I was talking with somebody just maybe a couple weeks ago, and, and they were asking how I, I knew that you know I had an arm or I could pitch or whatever. And I started thinking back, and the story that I thought of of the first time that I realized that you know I had a good arm in comparison to other kids my age and maybe a couple grades ahead of me was in um, in the Greek Orthodox uh, church system. There is a Junior Olympics. And it's for like all the young kids and they go and they have like a little Greek Olympics for all the churches in, you know, the Chicagoland area. And I was probably seven or eight. And the first year that you could enter, it was like nine or 10. So I was not supposed to enter it yet, but it was a softball throw. And it was just as far as you could throw a softball. And I I entered it as an eight year old and I won by like a hundred feet. So, so after that, people were like, you know, or people meaning like my dad and pitching coaches at that young of an age around my little league um, teams were like, maybe we should put this kid on the mound and see how he does. And, you know, put me on the mound and things kind of just progressed from there. Yeah. I know you, even from the days in Trenton, you were always big into golf. How, how good of a golfer are you? Uh, well, I got to be really good after the season last year when I came home, I was playing every day, I think between October and November when the weather started to change a little bit I played like 40 rounds of golf in 55 days it was something crazy and I got my index down to a 1.7 okay so I was I was firing low to mid 70s um pretty pretty consistently and then uh, now that the quarantine in in Illinois and Wisconsin is uh allowing golf I've been out playing and I've been shooting kind of upper 70s, low 80s right now. So I'm knocking some of the rust off. But, um, you know, it's it's a sport that I that I think I can relate to very well just because of pitching and the, and the muscle memory and, you know, trying to overswing on a golf ball is like trying to throw a fastball 105 miles an hour and some of the stuff is the same mentally. So it's, um, it's a lot of fun and, and you know, I, I always enjoy when I'm able to go out there and, and play some golf. I was going to ask you about that. I wasn't expecting to talk too much golf with you, but I guess we might as well. What I guess what is it about pitchers and golf that always seem to kind of go hand in hand? I guess you, you alluded to it a little bit there, but is it just kind of one of those just natural uh, attractions where uh, kind of just goes hand in hand, like you said? I think so. You know, first and foremost, I think pitchers we we have it easier in spring training. We're done before games start at like nine thirty or ten o'clock, and we're <laughs> sure. able to go out and play every day. Where the uh, position players and hitters have to stay and, you know, take BP and do fly balls and all this other stuff. Um, but luckily in spring training, they take it easy on us and there's only so many bullets that we have in our arms. So we go and play golf. And, um, you know, what I've noticed over the years is the approach to the golf swing and the pitching delivery is very, very similar. You know, one of the things that I've had a, an issue with still currently in my golf swing and earlier in my career i'd like to think that um as my career progressed i I got smarter and understood the delivery better and 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 how to how to do it more consistently but um you know sometimes i'm i'm standing at a dress trying to you know hit a golf ball 400 yards and i haven't even taken the club back to swing yet and that would happen the same way with pitching If, if i was throwing the fastball and i really wanted to get on it you know you create that that velocity and that and that good crisp action at the end of the delivery. So a lot of people think that you're going to start, you know, from the balance point or whatever, and you get riled up and you start throwing early. When in reality, is that crisp, that late, you know, release and wrist action through the ball is what causes that that velocity and the and the ball to spin tighter. And um, you know, it's one of those things that in 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 the pitching delivery, I was able to understand it and and kind of hone it in. But in, in golf, sometimes it's a uh, it's a little bit different, and I still try to hit it 400, 400 yards from the takeaway as opposed to through impact. Hmm. If that makes sense. Yes, yes, that uh, explains that pretty well. So Northwestern, <laughs> we we talked about that a little bit, but I guess was was wanting to go there somewhat, wanting to stay close to home because I would imagine that you had you were recruited pretty well out of high school. I would have to imagine. Yeah, so it's a fun, it's a funny story actually. I had a pitching coach um, from probably the age of ten through high school, and his name is Steve Sackis. Um, he, you know, former uh, major league uh, on the cusp of being a major league pitcher, but he blew out back in the you know forties and fifties. But uh, you know, he was he was involved in baseball for you know five decades. Uh, really, really well known and, and well respected guy around around this area, and you know from he knew he knew Tim Stoddard, who was my pitching coach at Northwestern for years and years. And 
the first or second time I ever had a pitching lesson when I was 10 or 11 years old, he was like, George, you're going to Northwestern. You're going to Northwestern. And I heard this for the next eight years. So when it came time for me to decide where I wanted to go to school, it was like the Manchurian candidate when I was like, I want to go to Northwestern <laughs> since I've heard it for so many years in a row, every pitching lesson, every Thursday that I, that I went to see him, you're going to go to Northwestern. You're going to go to Northwestern. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how I came to wanting to go to Northwestern. And, you know, once, once July 1st or July 3rd or whatever the date is after my junior uh, season of high school, when you can be recruited and the phone started ringing, I think Northwestern knew that I wanted to go there because they had some inside information because they didn't call me for like a week and I had everybody else calling me. I had, you know, most of the big programs in the country calling and I was sitting there thinking, why is Northwestern not calling me? So I, you know, I um, made a visit to university of Illinois. I um, was talking to Creighton. I was talking to Notre Dame. Um, but, uh, Northwestern finally came in and, um, being close to home was important for me, but I chose Northwestern just because academically it is a very, very, very good school. And, um, you know, I've had people tell me prior to making a decision to go to college, um, that talent or that scouts will find talent wherever it is. And the education is, is first and foremost. So, um, luckily Northwestern was right here in my backyard and, um, I'm very, very lucky and happy that it was close to home because my parents got to come and see, I think all my starts, but for maybe one or two in my entire college career. So, um, it worked out really, really well. And if I had to do it all over again, I would, I would do it the exact same way. You've never come off as like the, the stereotypical uh, dumb jock, I guess, so to speak. So how, how important was the, were the, the academics to you in kind of making that decision? And, and what was the, the academic life like there? Um, well, they were super important, actually. And, you know, my coming into my senior year of high school, my baseball coach um, told my dad, um, they kind of, thank God, left me out of, out of these decisions just because, you know, I was 17 and I was just focused on playing baseball. And my coach, my high school baseball coach called my dad. He's like, you know, my dad's name is Nick. He goes, Nick, you know, if George has a good year, he's throwing a little harder. I was up to, you know, 93 or 94 in one of these uh, showcase, the area code games uh, showcase, um, which I think they take all kids in their senior year or whatever. Um, and I went to the area codes and I pitched really, really well. And I was throwing hard and, he called my dad and he was like, there's a chance that he could get drafted really high. I'm already having scouts call and, and inquire and all that stuff about his availability. And my dad basically told my high school coach, he's like, he's going to college. So tell all these teams, don't waste a pick on him because he's going to school where he's we've already established. He's going to get his education. And my high school coach was like, well, what if he's a first or second round pick? That could be a pretty lucrative you know, day for him and for his future. And he's like, Nope, I don't care. Tell them not to waste the pick. He's going to college. Hmm. And looking back on it, it was a very, very, very smart thing for my dad to tell them because I was not anywhere near ready to be on my own in the real world playing professional baseball at the age of 18. I think I needed those years of um, maturing and growing and, you know, finding out who I was going to be as an adult in college, because I think most people that go to college, learn they do some things away from home that they're probably uh wouldn't do normally as, as you're growing up and i think i got some of that you know young adolescent stuff out of my system and you know when the draft came along the next time um i was ready to go and an adult enough to be on my own um from then moving forward but as far as how important the education was i got drafted and i started my classes for my last senior for my senior uh, school year I started those classes while I was at instructs with the Yankees and then I came back after instructs and I did my fall and winter quarter here at school and then I had one more quarter to go and I did that I negotiated with uh Mark Littlefield who was the um the player development uh head of all medical for player development for the Yankees and I had had my Tommy, or I had just had my Tommy John. I was in Tampa, and he's like, "Well, you're going to be here all off season. We're going to be working out." And I was like, "Hey, look, you know, I think you guys know that I, I'm, I'm a diligent worker. I'm disciplined. I get all my stuff done. Could I go back to Chicago to finish my degree? It's pretty important to me." And um, you know, we spent about half an hour finding a physical therapist and a facility here in Chicago that we both agreed on. 
Um, and I came here and I finished my, my last uh, quarter of school, got my degree, did my rehab and reported down to Tampa in January of that year, um, ready to go. Knock on wood, I had no setbacks with my elbow surgery and I made a recovery, full recovery in 10 and a half months and the rest is history. So you do end up getting drafted by the Yankees fifth round in 06. Um, how, how ready were you for that moment at that time? Cause you're talking about, you know, kind of maybe a couple years ago, maybe you wouldn't have been prepared for that. So how much did that experience at Northwestern kind of prepare you for that moment? I think my time at Northwestern was huge. And you know, the, the, the funny part and the crazy part that everyone always asks me is if you look at my um, statistics at Northwestern, they weren't, they weren't very good. You know, my ERAs were in the high fours, maybe low fives. But every year I pitched in summer league. And then as soon as pro ball started where guys were using wooden bats, my ERAs and numbers all got significantly better. You know, I think I got drafted and my ERA was like a 5'11". And then my first year in pro ball, which was just later that same summer, I had a like 2'7" through 90 innings in Staten Island. Yep. Um, and it was just a complete 180 turnaround. And I think just pitching inside with wooden bats where guys couldn't fight it off or, you know, get, get solid contact on it really, really helped me. And, you know, being able to throw my slider, which I think throughout my whole career was my best pitch, you know, sliders down the way and fastballs back then when I was throwing, um, you know, a few ticks harder, I think was, was a really good combination for me to keep guys off, um, off the, of my of my um, my breaking ball down and away by by busting them in, but you know the biggest thing is I, I've always been able to throw strikes. Now it's just pounding the zone, pounding the zone, and good things always tend to happen when you throw strikes. Um, like you said, you went to Staten Island that first year, and usually they, they kind of baby the the high round draft picks. It's an inning or two per start. I see you were averaging like five or six innings per start. Was were you a little bit surprised from the kind of just take the reins off and just let you go like that that early on? Um. To, to be honest with you, I didn't know what to expect, and I, you know, I, I went out there and just kept pitching, and I think it really helped that we were winning, and we ended up winning the entire league that year. Yeah. But what I what I really enjoyed, and I think this kind of helped me throughout my career in general. But being drafted by the Yankees and into a system where the parent club focuses on winning, like fundamentals are great. But winning is the most important thing. And I think that that was shown right from the beginning. You know, I remember we had, um, you know, Ian Kennedy and, you know, Mark Melanson and all, all those guys who were high, high round, high money guys were on that team and everyone pitched well, but they, they just kind of let us all go. And, and I had been, you know, I remember Ian Kennedy signed a little bit later. So he only made a couple starts for us and, they kind of took the reins off and let me go. I think we were on a pitch count. It was a hundred pitches, but you know, luckily I was efficient and I was going five, six, seven innings some of those times. And I think I threw, I think I went nine and one, including the playoffs in Staten Island. And I threw like 92 innings, which, which was, you know, quite a bit, but I mean, it was just things, things went well and we ended up winning the whole thing. I made three starts in the, in the playoffs that year. And I think I went six innings in all of those starts. So just kind of the innings added up. And then I went through, I think, 13 or 15 more in instructs that year. I think I finished that year with like 200 innings Oof. on the year. I mean, they were always pretty notorious with, with pitch limits and innings limits too. So that's surprising to hear from, from that time. But you mentioned some of the names that uh, were kind of in the system at that time pitching-wise. And um, I remember how loaded that system always was with arms. There was a ton of top prospects there how, <laughs> how, how difficult was that from a pressure standpoint to have to really establish yourself right away like that with all the guys that you were competing with for for jobs down the road honestly i think it we were all friends so it was it was kind of fun because you know there there was there was that little bit of friendly competition you know like guys like daniel mccutcheon and ian kennedy and jabba and you know phil coke and um you know, some of those other guys that, that we played with, we were all friends. So, like, it was all, you know, Touch would go out and pitch, and then I'd go out and pitch, and Ian would have his day. And everyone wanted to not be that the, that worst link or not have the worst stat line or whatever. And, you know, in 2007, Ian and Jabba both got to the big leagues. Yep. Um, and, you know, they, they both had great years. And Ian, Ian from the beginning, was, was, I think, very, very advanced. He was great stuff, knew how to pitch, located everything. Um, and then Jabba obviously had, had that power stuff, but, um, you know, a few of us other guys, we, we 
just kind of were competitive and we had good stuff, maybe not quite as refined as some of those guys at that time, but, um, you know, everyone was competitive. We all, we had a bunch of competitive guys that all wanted to go out there and say, Hey, look, this, I can do this too. So it it was a lot of fun. We we had a lot of fun and we, we played good baseball. 07, kind of a funky year for you, but I'm kind of more interested in kind of the way it ended with going to Hawaii. What was the, that experience like? Because obviously the Hawaiian Winter League isn't around anymore. So what was what was it like to, to get that experience? That was a lot of fun, actually. I didn't know what to expect. It was my first time ever being in Hawaii. And um, it, it was just another one of those really fun experiences where you get to go and, you know, be in a really cool place with a lot of really good other baseball players. And, um it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, you know, it was a long time ago now, it seems like. But what I remember was we played on a um, park and recreation field because the University of Hawaii's field where we were supposed to have our games, there were only four teams. So there was a day game and a night game every day. And we were supposed to just use the University of Hawaii's field, but it was under construction. So we played at like a community center park. Um, but the coolest part about that was there were a lot of Japanese players that were there and they were all great guys. And um, there are a couple of those guys and a couple of the staff that help out each team that I still keep in touch with to this day. So there were some guys that were really, really great guys that, that we met um, that, uh, that that made it a, a lot of fun out there. Yeah, you were teammates with, with Kanakoa out there as well. Did he kind of help you get the, the yeah. lay of the land? <laughs> you know, I, I, we, weren't, we weren't as close then as, as when uh, he came back to play. But the fact that we met out there and we had hung out a little bit, um, he, he and I, you know, connected once he was with the Yankees a, l- a little bit. And we became friends, and I haven't talked to him, him and him in a while, but we, we were definitely buddies, and he's, he's a really good guy. Yes, Conoco was great. Also ended up in the Atlantic League for a while, but we'll certainly get to that in your time there as well. But uh, Trenton 08, um, obviously the, the first thing I think of when I think about you and Trenton in 2008 is the non-trade. <laughs> The non-trade, yeah. Yes, I still vividly remember the the panic that happened after all of that, and you came up to the press box, and we're looking at our laptops and seeing, you know, what was going on, what wasn't going on, whether you were actually going, whether you weren't. I remember after that game, uh, the TV and the clubhouse was on ESPN, and there goes your name as being traded on the the ticker and the bottom line, and obviously that's not how it went. I guess what is kind of your recollection of of what must have been a very crazy day? Yeah, it was. Jeez, I remember. Uh, I remember. I was told um, that I was I was charting, and I was you know in the stands charting, and I was told that I was traded, and you know the exact kind of events that that took place. I don't really remember, but I do remember it was like a whirlwind that that kind of anxiety of like excitement and a little bit of panic of an uncertainty of what what happens now. Like I've never never been through this situation. Um, but what I, what I remember very vividly is, is Phil Coke and I got called into, uh, the office and told that we were traded and somebody would contact us, you know, to let us know whatever, either that night or first thing in the morning. And I was pitching the next day. I was scheduled to start the next day and it happened to be against Altoona, which is obviously Pittsburgh's double A team. Yep. And, and I got a call the next morning. Um, from from the manager and he said um hey the trade didn't go through two other guys are going i have no idea to this day why that trade didn't go through as it initially was supposed to but instead of myself and phil coke it was obviously daniel mccutcheon and jeff carstens and um uh, i went out that day and he, he goes he goes hey you're still pitching today so just be ready and it was a i think it was a sunday and it was a day game and it was against Altoona, and I go out, and I throw eight innings, one hit, and I punched out 13 guys. <laughs> and it was kind of one of those, like, oh, all right, I didn't even know why the trade didn't go through. But I was like, all right, you didn't want me? Here you go. I'm going to show you what you're missing out on. So it, it, was a, it, was a fun, uh, it was a fun start. I remember I was at 91 pitches through eight innings in a tie game, 0-0. And Scotty, Scott Aldred, the pitching coach at the time, goes, you're done. And I go, Scotty, I haven't even hit 100 pitches yet. Like, let me go back out there. And he's like, you're done. You're, you've are you pitched fantastic. The last thing you want to do is go give up a run in the ninth inning or an unearned run and take a loss today. And I was, like, pleading with him. I'm like, let me go back out there. Let me go back out there. And and I wasn't allowed to go back out there. We ended up winning one nothing in the ninth. I think Eric Wardekemper might have gotten the win because I think he probably pitched the ninth. He was our closer. 
Um, but that that was a uh, that was definitely a funny time. Yes, former Somerset Patriot Scott Aldred, by the way. I don't know if you knew that or not, but. Um, yes, you, you led the team in starts that year in 08, but you ended up going back to Trenton to start out the year in 09. You were never a guy who was shy about kind of voicing your frustrations with things. And I remember you were not thrilled about that at that time. So how difficult was it to come back? And then how rewarding was it to kind of get that quick call up to Scranton like you did? Well, the thing that I've learned in my career and I've learned it, you know, I learned it early with that, um, little situation that happened, but I learned it a lot more in, in the big leagues getting up with the option game and all that is um, there are things that you just can't control. And in the Yankee system, they typically at that time, they progress guys fairly, but they also stock guys in triple a that can help the big leagues that weren't prospects that were veteran guys. Yeah. And they had a stacked triple a pitching staff. And it was just one of those things where like, Hey, you should be going there, but we're full right now, so you're going to have to go back. And I remember I threw, I want to say I, I threw like 170 innings in 2008 in Trenton, and I finished with like the third lowest ERA of, of any starter, maybe third in strikeouts as well. Um, and just the fact that I had had such a good year, in my opinion, and it was going back was just a little bit of a letdown. But, you know, the, the only thing you can do is just is to use that to fuel you forward as opposed to getting irritated or pissed off. And, you know, then you go out there and your performance struggles a little bit. And then all, all they can say is, see, look, we made the right decision because he wasn't ready to go to AAA or whatnot. And I think I made three starts in 2009 before moving up. And I think I went seven innings, seven innings and seven innings and gave up like three runs. Um total in, in that time and then I got moved up and um you know pitch continue to pitch well but um you know all, all you can do is is continue moving forward putting one foot in front of the other and controlling the things that you can control and I think that was the biggest thing over the years that I've been able to do a pretty good job of in my playing career is just controlling what I'm able to control there are things that regardless of how I feel about them regardless of what happens there's just nothing that's going to change that fact and um you know, it was just one of those one of those early situations that I had in my career that that just proved that that was the case. Just go out there, continue pitching. Things will work themselves out, um, and they did. Luckily, obviously, you couldn't control the whole TJ situation later that year. It seemed like you were kind of maybe at that point on track to maybe at the end of that year get your first opportunity in the big league. So to to go down at that time, uh, especially with the opportunities that kind of arose later after the fact, I guess how frustrating was that for you to have to deal with all that? It, well, it was very frustrating because what I I mean I remember I had thrown I think like seventy something innings and I had done really well. I had like a like a two two ERA through eight or nine starts in triple A. And um I knew that Andy Pettit, I believe, this is the, at least a story that I got many, many years ago. Who knows the the truth to it. But um Andy Pettit went on the DL with a uh shoulder impingement, something like that, in in at the end of June. And from what I was told after I had had my, my surgery and all that was they were debating of giving me a call up or Sergio Mitre, who they ended up calling up and making those starts. And, um, I remember it was my birthday. It was my 24th birthday when I blew my arm out, we were in Gwinnett and I was pitching and it was on my 24th birthday and I threw a pitch and it just, I felt like a burning sensation right in my elbow. And then I kind of shook it off and it went away and like, Four pitches later, I threw it again, and it was a more intense uh, burning. And it felt like my forearm, after I would release the pitch, kind of kept going. And then my my bigger muscles, bicep, tricep, forearm muscles, would engage and kind of like pull it back. And it wasn't pain. It wasn't like a pop and the ball goes sideways or whatever. It was just something didn't feel right. Um, I woke up the next day. I couldn't fully bend my arm and... Um, you know, went, went for the MRI and it was clear as day. Uh, Dr. Ahmad was like, you have a 100% tear of your UCL. And he goes, I, I'll never forget it. He goes, I do not re- I recommend rehab. I recommend, uh, a reconstruction. And then he just goes, I'll give you a minute to let this sink in. And he walked out of the, out of the, uh, little, little room there where we were looking at the MRI and it felt like the walls were closing in. It was kind of, it was kind of a nuts nuts feeling uh when you're told something that uh is potentially life-changing who knows after that what could happen but at that moment in time it was pretty nuts and luckily uh 
I was able to work my way back and and uh, have my fair share of major league time. But having been told that I was potentially being considered for a call up um, at that point in time and going down like that was definitely a uh, uh, something that makes your your stomach drop a little bit. Yeah, go through the whole rehab process, come back as a reliever. Um, was that was that always the plan? Was that something kind of designed to take the stress off of the arm uh, at least initially? I guess what was kind of the, the thought process behind kind of moving you to that role? So the whole time I was I was told um, that I was going to rehab and come back as a starter, and I made my first rehab appearance. Um, it was like a live bullpen, or maybe it was just a controlled GCL game or something. Um, and I threw two innings, and the next day I came in, and uh, the rehab coordinator at that time was Gil Patterson. And Gil called me in, and we were talking with uh, um, – Jeez, I don't even remember who we were talking with now. But they, they basically told me, uh, we are going to bring you back as a reliever because we think with your slider and secondary stuff, you can help out at the big league level much sooner as a reliever. So not having to build up, after that I had you know maybe two or three more outings and I was just ready to go, thrown into the action to build back up. And then um, I ended up getting to the big leagues the following year uh, in 2011. Yes, but there was a bit of a, a weird step between that, though, the whole Rule 5 thing. Um, that's right, that's right. Yeah, I mean, what do you remember about that? Because I, I remember seeing that your name was even, uh, that they didn't protect you. I guess that was kind of weird to begin with. So what was the whole process of going through that like? Because San Diego was who ended up taking you. That's right, yeah. It was San Diego. I had just, uh, I had pitched in the Fall League. So I, I rehabbed back, and I went to um, the Arizona Fall League. I threw 30, or I threw 50 innings, I think total that year the year i came back from tommy john so i i did my um um my rehab all the way through june until i was cleared to fully play and then once the kind of uh the reins were taken off a little bit i ended up throwing i think 50 innings that year and it had been like 15 straight months of working out and constantly going at it trying to get back something it was something crazy like that and um I was just tired and I didn't, and I didn't pitch all that well in the Arizona fall league. I had like a nine ERA. And so the fact that I did get rule five was a little bit of a shock, but got rule five. And, um, they say that you don't come back fully from Tommy John where you're just, you know, back to everything, um, as prior until that first full season back, which was the full 2011 season. So I went into spring training, um, as potentially the seventh guy in the Padre bullpen. And um, they signed, uh, the the Padre signed somebody three or four days into spring training uh, for that seventh spot in the bullpen. And as soon as that happened, it was kind of one of those things like, oh, well, you know, this rule five kid is still here kind of deal. Um, And I didn't didn't pitch all that great either out there. It was a new environment, and I've typically taken a little bit of time to kind of get my feet under me. especially back then when it was all just, you know, still trying to prove yourself, still trying to prove that you belong and all that. And, um, so I didn't pitch all that well in that spring training and I got sent back. Um, but they did say, they did say like, Hey, you know, we really like you. We just think we need to, you need a little bit more time. Um, so we're going to try and trade for you, um, and keep you here. And I was sitting in the room when the GM at the time was speaking to Cashman and he, and Cashman was just like, no, we, we'd like him back. So whatever. So we're like, well, thank you for coming and blah, blah, blah. And I remember I called my dad and my dad flew out and we drove cross country to Tampa in my car like two days later. And I was back at Yankee camp, backing up a major league spring training game like three days later, which was, which was kind of, uh, kind of surreal. But, um, you know, as the protocol kind of called for as 2011 trucked on, Um, My stuff got better. I felt a lot more normal like myself, not thinking about anything other than just going out and pitching. And uh, I I had a really, really good year that year in 2011. I was kind of in the bullpen, but also a swing man. I think I made five starts that year on top of just being in the bullpen all year. So um, when August ended and the minor league season ended, I had ended up throwing like 93 innings that year uh, out of the pen and starting. And then, um, there was, there was Nardi Contreras that actually told me, he's like, Hey, look, um, you know, we don't think we're going to call you up. 
because we would like you to uh, go play for Team USA in whatever the, the whatever games they were going to play, wherever they were at that year. Um, and and it's one of those things where you where you had to be a non forty man to play. And he's like, let me know. That's that's what we want you to do. And I was kind of thinking to myself, I was like, you know, I I've really earned a shot at at pitching in the big leagues. I've I've done well. I watched all these guys this year: Kevin Whalen, Lance Pendleton. All these guys get called up ahead of me. Yep. And I ended up pitching really really well. And I had my a great year, and I've earned it. And I, I kind of talked over with my family, and I spoke to you know my dad, and I was like, you know what, no, I'm telling you, no, I'm not going. So I told Nardi, I'm like, you know what, Nardi, I'm, I'm not going to go. Um, you know, if you guys don't want to call me up, that's that's fine. I understand. I just, you know, I'll take my chances with the rule five again, because you can be rule you can be rule five again if you're not protected. And then the next day was the last day of the season, and I ended up getting called up. So I I hate to think that I that I kind of push their hand a little bit but um i i basically was like you know what i'm, I'm gonna forego these this team usa thing and it ended up getting me called up which i think in turn got me traded to san francisco so my my little bit of pushback i think which is the only time in my career i've done it um ended up potentially being the best thing that could have happened given the circumstances i guess was it still kind of a special moment to to find out that you were getting that call up oh it was uh it was probably I still remember that very, very vividly. I was sitting in my locker in the Scr- in the Scranton clubhouse, and it was September third, I believe, two thousand and eleven. And my truck was packed up, ready to drive from Scranton back to Chicago. And uh, the game was over. I was showered up, and Scotty was like, "Hey, George, you know, come here for a second. And we get called into to Dave Miley's office, and it was myself and. Um, Dellen Batansis and Andrew Brackman, I believe, were all in there. And Dave Miley was just like, you guys are going to New York. And I literally just jumped out of the room, went into the weight room, called my, my dad. And I was like, we're going, I said, we're, I said, we're going to the big leagues. And, uh, it was awesome. It was, it was, I was practically in tears then. Uh, it was super special, especially, especially, uh, being able to overcome all the stuff with the Tommy John and then going through the rule five and getting sent back and, and all that. And it was just a, a great culmination of all the hard work that the minor leagues had that I've put in throughout the minor leagues. What do you remember about the first game in, uh, I guess it was in Anaheim or LA, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Cause that, that lineup at that time was, was loaded. It wasn't Mike Trout was, I know you faced Trout. He struck Trout out. He wasn't Mike Trout at that time, but you still struck out Mike Trout. Um, what do you remember about that whole experience? I remember, funny story, what I remember about my first day in the big leagues, I get called up to New York, and I drive just a little precursor to my debut, but I, um, we were facing Baltimore, and it was the last time Baltimore was coming to New York, and it was raining, so we were sitting there in a holding pattern, and they didn't start the game, if you remember, until like 11.45 in 2011, that was the last time they were coming, and they wanted to get the gate in, so it's... You know, the game starts at 11.45. I couldn't even tell you who started anymore, but it's the bottom of the, about to be the bottom of the eighth inning, and we're up four to one. So the phone rings, and there's there's one out, and I want to say guys on first and second. And the phone rings, and Mo is already warming up, and Harkey answers the phone, and I'm thinking there's no way that this is going to be me. Like, there's no way. So I'm kind of just sitting there. I had already stretched out earlier and was ready to go, not thinking in a million years I would go in in such a close game on my first day in the big leagues with the Yankees in a, you know, playoff chase. So Harky goes, Contos, get up. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he just goes, get up. We score these two, you're in. So I'm in a full-blown panic at this point. And – I get up, and at this point, there, there was there was no need to stretch. There was no need. I was fully ready to go, just based on how fast my heart was beating. And Jesus Montero was down in the bullpen to help catch um, some of some of these guys, since there were so many uh, roster additions in, in September. My first throw, Mariano was on the um, the mound closest to the glass, and I was on the mound closest to um, the outfield. My first throw went about 47 feet right into the <laughs> ground, and it hit the backstop, and 
Mo just turned to me and started laughing. He goes, you okay, man? And I go, yeah, 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 I'll be fine. You just, you, you're going in this game. You keep warming up. My second throw was like a bullet right at Montero's chest. And I think I had knocked all the rust off because I was, I mean, I was ready to go after that second throw. But I ended up warming up for maybe four pitches and they got a double play or two quick outs and I ended up not going in the game. But fast forward another week. So I sat there for a week, did not pitch, was just, you know, happy to be there and getting a taste of what it's like being in the major leagues. And then the Anaheim uh, series shows up and CC started and, um, who was catching? I think Russell Martin was catching to start the game. Uh, CC was out in the sixth and Russell Martin took a, uh, a foul ball to his right throwing uh, thumb and like ripped the nail off. And, um, Hector Noessi went in to finish the sixth inning for CC. And I went in with one out in the seventh. So I'm warming up and finally, you know, Joe is heading out to the mound and he, they signal to call me in and, and I, I walked down the stairs. Harky gives me a pat in the back, you know, good luck. We'll get them, whatever. And they open the gates um, of left field to run onto the field for the first time. And all I see is I happen to look left and I look up at that massive jumbotron they have in right center field um, at Angel Stadium. And they show me running onto the field. And I don't think I've ever been more terrified than that first initial few steps onto the field because the, um, the camera was on me. Everything was just kind of a whirlwind. And then I get to the mound. And I'm greeted on the mound by Joe Girardi. And Jorge is catching at this point. Jorge Posada is catching. Yep. Alex is at third. Derek is at short. Um, Cano is at second. And Teixeira is at first base. So I'm greeted by all these guys on the mound. And it was super, super surreal. I was like, this is kind of insane right now, grasping what's happening. So Joe gives me the ball. Everyone kind of disperses. And that was the first time when everyone left the mound that I finally felt comfortable. And I started warming up like I had done a million times over the years on, you know, on the mound by myself. And um, that was pretty, that was pretty, pretty incredible that, uh, you know, getting on there and, and realizing like, hey, you're in the big leagues now finally with all of these kind of, you know, they're all legends um, standing on the mound with me. I remember the first uh First guy I faced was Peter Borges. He swung at a high fastball and popped it up to Jeter um, for, for the final out of that inning. And we ran inside, and, and you know, Joe patted me on the butt and says, you're still in there. And then um, I go and sit down, and Jeter is coming. He came in closer to first base on that side. And he came, sat next to me, like super subtle, didn't make a big scene about it, but he came, sat next to me. He took the, the ball, that I it was, which was my first out, he put it in my glove, and this is this is one of those stories that whenever anybody asks me about Derek Jeter, I tell them this story and you know, how there's nobody in the game that I respect more than that guy because he sat down next to me, put the ball in my glove, and just said, hey, welcome to the big leagues, congratulations. He's like, you've worked your whole life for this, and you know you deserve to be here. You know, you, This is the same game that you've played in the minor leagues. There are more people in the stands, and the lights might be a little bit brighter, but it's the same game. Keep doing what you're doing. And then just got up and went to the on-deck circle because he was batting second, I think, that inning. And that has always stuck with me because a guy like him had no reason to do that other than he's just a great guy, a great leader. And he just went a little bit out of his way to make a guy like me feel comfortable and like I belonged. So that was, that was pretty unbelievable for, you know, for him to do that and make me feel, feel special like that. Yeah, obviously you had some time in big league camp with, with a lot of these guys, but to actually be around that, I mean, that team was absolutely loaded, like you said. So to be around that clubhouse, uh, to start out your big league career, I mean, are you are you looking around going, you know, holy shit, I can't believe like I'm around like, you know, this, you know, caliber of guy? Or are you just treating him like, you know, this is, you know, this is Derek, this is Alex? Like what is kind of your, your mindset when you're just basically a, a young kid uh, around some of these guys? Well, initially, you know, as, as I got older and, and more, you know, mature in the game and, and grew up a little bit and spent more time, you know, in the major leagues, you realize that, you know, spring training, you're around these guys, but nobody, it, spring training is not the same. You know, it's not the same as when you show up to a major league ballpark to play a real major league game. And for a guy like me, my, my spring trainings, at least with the Yankees, until that last one in 2012, before I got traded, you know, I always knew that at some point I was going to get sent out, you know, I was just kind of happy to be there when I knew I was going to double a, or when I was, when I knew I was going to triple a already, 
you know, it, I was not making those teams, especially in that organization. When they, you know, now that I've been around a little bit, I see how guys, you know, the prospects are coming in to show what they can do. But the guys who are going to make that team are, are the guys who have been there who are on guaranteed deals or some of those veteran guys that they bring in on minor league deals, you know, that are expected to compete for a spot in the team. So, you know, it was one of those things where I knew I was going to get sent down in spring training and you, you're, you're there to impress, but you're also there to have a good time and kind of get your feet wet a little bit around that type of environment. Um, but definitely being in, in the clubhouse with them in New York and on the road and stuff, it's a whole different animal and it's, it's, it's a lot more serious, but it's a lot more fun. You know, there's that energy and electricity in the air all the time. It seemed like around that organization. Yeah. You talked about the getting, getting traded to the giants. And, um, I think for a lot of people on the outside looking in, that was a huge surprise. And you said maybe it wasn't so much of a surprise for you, given the way things went down in September. Um, I guess what was that that moment like when you found out that you were uh, heading out to San Francisco? Well, it was it was it was crazy to be honest with you. It was the last day of spring training, and what I think what had happened was it was myself, David Phelps, and Adam Warren. We had all three gotten optioned earlier in spring training um, to avoid. Uh, that injury date, you know, that there's that date where if, if a player on the 40 man is in spring training and gets hurt, that they have to. The Humberto Sanchez rule, yes. I guess, is what, what they've called it. Um, so we were technically optioned, but they kept us in big league camp to still be there, I guess, and eat up innings, whatever you want to call it. But at this point in time, it's the last day of spring. There's one spot available in the, in the Major League bullpen, and David Phelps and I are still there. So... You know, it's we're playing the Mets at home, and I start warming up to go in to pitch the ninth inning um, in in this game. And the phone rings, and Harky goes, "Hey, they want to see you in the office." And I was like, "This is weird." Um, you know, I was supposed to be pitching next inning, and somebody else pitched uh, one of the backups that had come up from minor league camp. And um, I go in the office thinking that this has got to be a good thing, right? If they told me I wasn't going to make the team, it would have been after the game, I would imagine, not right as I'm going to warm up. Yep. So I get into Joe's office, and there's there's Brian Cashman, Billy Upler, um, and Joe Girardi. They're staying there. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a little weird. And I'm, you know, Joe just shook my hand and says, George, we've traded you to the Giants. And I was like, what? For real? Uh, just like that, like exactly like I couldn't believe it. You know, everyone, it happened so fast. It was in a matter of probably 45 seconds. Cash started talking. He's like, yeah, you know, we uh, we needed a little bit of catching depth and this and that. And so we traded you for for Chris Stewart, who I had known Stewie and played with Stewie in Scranton in 2009, uh, the year that I had my Tommy John. So I was like, oh, my gosh, no way. And he's like, and Cash was like, you know, you're – you would have been in a great situation here, but this was a move that we needed to make. And, you know, you're going to be in a great situation over there. They need pitching help. You're going to be a guy that's going to help out there. You know, thanks for everything you've done. Shook my hand and that was it. And it was, it was, it happened so fast. So at, initially I walked out of there being like being with my head in a whirlwind. I, I was, you know, nobody likes change. I had this fairy tale in my head that I was going to spend my entire career as a Yankee and it was going to be like Derek Jeter and, you know, the uh, the young naive mindset of a uh, of a young potential major leaguer at the time, and um, I get traded, and I speak to Bobby Evans, who's the assistant GM of the Giants, and you know George, we're happy to have you. We're looking forward to getting you out here to Arizona, blah blah blah. So it w- it was it was nuts, and at first at first I was not happy about it, and then within six months, it was the best thing that had ever happened to me. Well, yeah, obviously, I mean, going on to, to win the World Series and get the opportunities that you did. But when you, when you look back on it, do you think that you would have gotten the same opportunities had you stayed with the Yankees that you did ultimately get with the Giants? My my deep down gut honest answer is no, I don't. I think that um, I would have, if if all things were the same, I think that I would have gotten an opportunity with the, with the Yankees. But I think at the time with how the Yankees, you know, were. I think that it, the success that I had in San Francisco had all things been equal. I don't think it would have been the same in New York. So 2012, um, I mean, there's so many places to go with you, but I guess maybe the best way to do it is, is when you think of 2012, and obviously besides the trade, when you think of 2012, uh, what are some of the first things that come to mind? Oh, man, it was 
what a whirlwind. Um, the first thing when I think of 2012, and it might be very random, is outside of winning the World Series, obviously, because that's that's the, the first thing that, that comes to mind. But I, I had a an outing in 2012, and it was the second-to-last game of the season, Game 161 against the Dodgers in L.A., and the reason why it stands out to me is because that was when I cemented in my own brain that I belonged in the big leagues and that I knew that I could go out, I could do this on a daily basis consistently and that I belonged. And it was, we had won the division um, by like seven or eight games at this point. And this was the year where the Dodgers had traded for Adrian Gonzalez and Nick Punto and uh, Carl Crawford and Josh Beckett. They made that blockbuster trade with with, uh, Boston. And we were supposed to get waxed all over the place. We were not supposed to do anything. And lo and behold, it's the end of the year. We had won the division. The Dodgers were one game behind the Cardinals for the second wildcard spot. And it's the seventh inning of a game in Dodger Stadium. It was a packed house, 62,000 people, I think. And we're up 4-1. to And it's the seventh inning. And Barry Zito started the game. And he went uh, maybe a batter into the seventh. And then Guillermo Moda, who was kind of the swing man for the Giants at the time, he had been there for for quite a few years, Um, he went in. And within six pitches, it was four to three with two outs and Shane Victorino on third base and Matt Kemp was coming up. And I warmed up probably in six pitches, and Boach was already out walking towards the mound after I had thrown, like, five fastballs. So I get called into the game. And Dodger Stadium's always a little bit of an intimidating place only because it gets really loud, and there's no backstop. It's all fence. So you're looking, and all you see is fans everywhere. And um, I get called into the game. Tying run is on third base in a packed house, and – it's a, obviously a very important game because if they lose this game, it essentially eliminates them from postseason competition um, because the Cardinals had already won their game on the East Coast. And I get in and I go ball one, ball two to Matt Kemp. And then I, I come back with two fastballs um, for the count to be even, two and two. And then I throw him a really good slider. Um, and he strikes out, swings and misses, and he gets really upset. He throws his bat. And I had one of those moments on the mound where I let out like an essentially a Jabba like belch where I was, you know, freaking out and I fist pumped and I, you know, had, had a really let out of emotion. And, you know, right there, I think is when I solidified myself as a major league pitcher. And I also put myself on the postseason roster with that at, um, at that, because I think I've proved to Bochi and Rigetti that I could go in and handle pressure. Um, but it was, that, that was probably the a defining moment in my career for sure. And then the other thing, other than winning the World Series of 2012, was Matt Cain's perfect game, which was three days, two days after I got called up to the big leagues, and I'm watching the 20, 20th or 21st perfect game in Major League history yeah. being thrown. It was pretty incredible. Um, you mentioned kind of just that, that late season push of getting put onto the, the postseason roster, earning your way onto the postseason roster. Did you expect to be used as frequently early in the postseason as you were? You pitched in four of the division series games, three of the championship series games. Did you expect to be used that often? Well, the thing, the thing that, that another reason uh, why I made the comment earlier about the San Francisco versus New York um, potential successes was Bruce Bochy, not that Joe Girardi, Joe Girardi is a great manager as well, but Bruce Bochy, he rides the hot hand and he goes with guys. He puts you in situations that he knows that you're comfortable in and can have success in. And, you know, I've, I made 300 appearances under Bruce Bochy in a San Francisco Giants uniform. So um, early on there, he, he knew where I kind of had the most comfort and where he trusted me. And I knew kind of when the phone was going to ring, when it would be my name. Um, so it got to the point where, you know, if we were up or down, if you we were up by a couple or down by like one or two in those, in that fifth, sixth, maybe seventh inning and the phone rang, I was already up throwing because I knew that it was going to be my situation. And Boach loved riding the hot hand. If you were, if you were pitching well, he would, he would pitch you until, and he would always check in with you. He'd be like, Hey, how you doing today? Can I use you for an out? Can I use you for an inning? Whatever it was. Um, but if you were ready to go and that situation came up, you were going in the game. And I knew that, and he had confidence in me, and I knew how the game would, would, was going to play out when the phone was ringing. 
So he just put he put you in a position to succeed, and whenever you did your job, the team is obviously going to have its own success if everyone does their jobs. So um, I think the fact that Boach was kind of the bullpen wizard that he was, it really made me comfortable and confident in my job and going out there and doing the things that I was supposed to do. Um, every kid dreams about either pitching or hitting in the World Series. You got to, to pitch in the World Series in Game 1. I can't even imagine what what that was like. Um, just tell me everything about it, man, because everybody listening to this is, is never going to get that opportunity. I'm never going to get that opportunity. Just what, what do you remember about it? What I remember is being... So in San Francisco, in right field, you have that out-of-town scoreboard. Yeah. That's kind of like Fenway where they, they manually put in each number and each team and all that stuff. And what I remembered was, you know, the playoffs, when the playoffs started, it was kind of like a normal game with a little bit more electricity, you know, in the stands, right? So, you know, the, as the NLDS went by, it was like no big deal. You know, like we're, we're one of eight teams still. So, like, whatever. It's the playoffs. This is awesome. It's a great electric environment, you know. And then you move down to the NLCS and you'd look out there and you'd only see – four teams on the board and then as the world series came around there were no more teams on there it was it was empty so it kind of hit that this was the world series and i was warming up and you know it was one again one of those things like my debut where as soon as my name was called i i didn't even need to throw any of those pitches you could have sent me right from the dugout straight to the mound and i'd have been ready to go um but from what my dad tells me my parents they they stayed in chicago to watch those games because no matter what happened, we were going to Detroit for games three and four. um, And they came to those games and and saw, saw the culmination of the series and us winning everything, which was awesome. But my dad said that when I got on the mound in 2012, my first batter, he, his exact words to me were, you looked terrified. (laughs) And, and, and that's the only time I can admit that's the only time I've ever been nervous on the mound because I think it was a culmination of my, my dreams from a little kid, from all everything that I had you know, dreamed about growing up, pitching in this situation, and this was it. And um, I, think the mo- I think the moment initially I let get the best of me. Um, and then I, I ended up giving up, uh, I gave up a two-run homer in, in the World Series. Got, got an out, but gave up a two-run homer, and uh, the ball actually... I mean, he hit it well, dead center in San Francisco, which you need you need to hit the ball. You need to put a good charge in it to get it out at night in dead center in at AT&T Park. But um, the ball, uh, Angel Pagan jumped, and the ball bounced off the top of his glove over the fence oh. um, for, for a two-run homer. But um, that was my – that's my recollection of uh, – of the 2012 game one world series. It was, it was awesome. It was incredible. It, it is something I still remember very, very vividly. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that if, if, if I could ever have an opportunity to have done it again, a second time, I would be much, much more ready, prepared under control. But that first, that first moment was, it was, there were some nerves for sure. So what is it like then celebrating winning the world series? Well, I watched the game, 2012 game four was actually on MLB Network yesterday, and I was watching it, and I, uh, you know, all those emotions started coming back, Um, but I remember Javier Lopez and I were standing on the bench in the left field uh, visitor's bullpen, and kind of looking at each other like, oh my God, oh my God, as as Sergio Romo is facing uh, Miguel Cabrera, and as soon as he threw the fastball to catch him looking to end the game. I remember we had hopped over that fence and the run from the fence to the dog pile. I don't even remember it. Huh. Like it was totally just, it was a blackout moment. It was just, you know, it's, it's, it's such an amazing feeling to accomplish something that a, you've dreamed about your entire life. That's the reason why you played the game, right? Everyone plays the game because, you know, they think that all baseball players make, Hundred and fifty million dollars, which we know isn't true, and then you also play to win a World Series and play for the trophy and win a ring and do all that. And for that to have happen for me in my first season, my first real full season ish in the big leagues was um, just such a special moment. It was it was unbelievable. It's something that you know I am now 
along with my teammates and everybody else in the organization, were enshrined in, in history for this common thing that we all share. And it's something truly, truly special. You know, I remember right before the parade in San Francisco, we were in the, uh, I was in the training room and Boach walked in and we were chatting for, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. And he's like, you know what, at some point, whether it's later this off season, next year, in five years, he's like, you're going to look back on what this team accomplished this postseason in order to win the World Series. You know, we came back from a 2-0 deficit in the NLDS and then a three, one deficit in the NLCS. And we, we won six elimination games in one postseason, which I don't think had ever been done before. And he's like, you're going to sit back and you're going to reflect on this. And you're going to realize just how special what we've done actually is. And now that I look back on it, I understand exactly what he meant. And it was just something that's so special. And, um, you know, something that we're all going to look back on and say we were a part of it. And we did that, you know, all those years down the road. And everyone's going to always talk about it. It's, it's, it's something that's super, super amazing. And I'm very, very humbled and fortunate to have been a part of it. So before I ask you about getting to do it again a couple of years later, there's always kind of one <laughs> goofy story I always kind of want to ask you about and pick your brain on. Because I saw the YouTube clip uh, in 13 of the, the suspension. It's the one blemish on your record. The only context I have, <laughs> only context I have on it is the clip starts. You're behind 2 nothing. You're facing McCutcheon. It looked like kind of a fastball or something. Maybe they kind of tailed in on him a little bit. So is there some sort of story behind what happened there or what really happened or what happened before all that that led up to that? What's the deal? So, you know, I mean, I, I think you know the unwritten rules of, of sure. baseball. It's one of those things. Um, but that was Garrett Cole's major league debut that day. Okay. And, and he was throwing really, really hard, as he still does. Um, and he was amped up, but he hit Marco Scudero in the hand and he broke his left pinky finger. And then he threw an inside fastball and he hit Gregor Blanco in the ribs and took him out of the game as well. Um, you know, and I was just came in the game and I was pitching inside and one got away from me. Mm. Yes. Uh, very unfortunate how that happens sometimes. Right. So. Exactly. Yes. Uh, well, luckily, luckily that it, it only got away from me on his lower half. Yes, 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 yes. Are you expecting to be suspended then? you kind of know that's coming? Oh, my gosh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Especially, I mean, every, everyone's been, you know, everyone's been warned and all that. And I mean, I think, I think if, you, if you watch the rerun of that, as soon as the umpire comes out and takes his mask off, I start, like, walking off the field. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you said a word. I watched the clip. I don't think you said a word. You just walked off, and no. that was pretty much it. You know, I, I think I did the due diligence of taking two or three steps toward home plate. No, obviously knowing that nothing was going to happen. Andrew McCutcheon and I were teammates after that a couple of years later. And uh, he's a great guy and, and, you know, awesome guy. But, you know, you, you, do, you do the customary, take a few steps forward, and then a little veer left to the dugout. Yeah. Like you said, you guys played together a couple of years later. Does that ever come up in conversation? Does he remember that? Does he bring that up to you? How does that go? Oh, my gosh. It's so funny, actually. So I got I got um, revocable waiver trade claimed whatever you want to call it in august yes after the 2017 um trade deadline so i get a call and you know our gm at the time uh bobby evans was like you know what george you guys were all on revocable waivers and the pirates have claimed you uh to block you from going to uh the cubs and uh we are gonna actually let your rights go to the pirates and i was like oh my god really so that was another that was probably an even more difficult day was, was leaving a, uh, you know, cemented place that I had been for so long to go there. But, yeah. um, I go to, I go to Pittsburgh and I get there, I get to the uh, PNC park for the first time and I'm sitting in the, um, in Clint Hurdle's office with, um, you know, the pitching coach and the GM with, uh, Neil and, um, <laughs> Clint goes, after you go to your locker and drop your stuff off, just do me a favor before game time find McCutcheon and just make sure you guys are cool. And he said it with a smile on his face and, you know, Clint, Clint's a little bit of a joker and it was, it was fine, but I went and found McCutcheon and, you know, introduced myself formally. And I was like, Hey man, you all right from a couple of years ago? Has your, uh, has your rear end healed? Are we all good? And he started, he started laughing. He's like, all good, man. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. So it was fun. We, we laughed it off and, and, uh, and Andrew's a, Andrew's a great guy. So, do we have to kind of circle back to uh, getting to do the whole World Series thing again? Um, was the experience different, kind of not being as big of a, a part of it playoff roster-wise? Um, you know, it, it was. I was a little bit, obviously, 
this is one of those kind of uncontrollables again. Yeah. Um, I, it was my last option year that year, and I had bounced up and down, I think, six times between AAA and the big leagues that year. Um, but my time in the big leagues, it was just a numbers game, right? You know, the, the Giants had signed some guys who had ops after spring training. I had a really good spring. I think I gave up two runs in like 11 innings, and I get called in, and I'm being told I'm optioned, and I was not happy about it. But, hey, what can I do? You know, you can't cry over spilled milk at that point. Um, but my, my time in the big leagues had been very effective. I, I'd thrown like 40 innings, and I had pitched to like a 2-7 um, that season from going up and down. Um, so I fully expected to, you know, be on the postseason roster and do all that stuff. And, you know, they, they opted to go with – a little bit more firepower in Hunter Strickland that, 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 um, that year, but I was there as a reserve and, um, you know, all you can do at that point, at that point is, you know, root for your teammates and stay ready. And you're still part of the team. You know, you're still, I I still know that I'm a guy who helped them get there. I pitched some very meaningful, meaningful innings that year. And, um, you know, I look at it like, who knows what could happen if, if I didn't do well a couple of those games and we don't win a game or something, we don't get into the wild card and, and bum doesn't get to go throw his complete game shutout. So I, you know, I looked at it that way and I was supporting my team and my teammates and I still have all of those memories and I get the same ring that they do. The only thing I didn't get to do was go on the field and compete. And as much as I would have loved to have that opportunity, it, it again, it's, you know, I'm part of something that was unbelievably special and um, you know, part of what made our organization and our team in those years a dynasty. So, um, you know, being a reserve was not what I would have, you know, done if I was making the rosters up, but it's, uh, it's what it was. And I supported the guys and I got to celebrate just the same. So it was, it was fantastic. How special then was it to, to get back to pitching in the playoffs a couple of years later, especially at Wrigley field? How meaningful was that to you? That was crazy. And, it, you know, if I could have one pitch back, it would have been even better. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, I mean, other like I got to cover the World Series there a couple years ago, and just the, the, experience, the atmosphere of the playoff game at Wrigley is incredible. And, obviously, you kind of growing up in that area, and I know read some stories about you kind of hanging out during 03, kind of outside of the ballpark and all that stuff. Um, so, oh, yeah. to, to be on the mound and kind of – you know, soak all that in as a, as a Chicago guy. Uh, what was that like? You know, it, it was it was incredible. Um, you know, obviously the the rooting for the Cubs and, and all that stuff. You know, ended in two thousand and six when I got drafted. Sure. You know, in two thousand six, I rooted for the Yankees. Two thousand twelve until two thousand seventeen, I rooted for the Giants and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, playing at Wrigley at a place so historic and monumental and so part of you know, my childhood and growing up and the amounts of countless games that I've seen there and, and you know, all, all that pitching in front of people that, that my, you know, my family members, my friends, my teachers, you know, people that have supported me and had significant influence um, on my life throughout, you know, the years that um, I've, I've lived here and grew, grown up here and all that. It's always very, very special for me going to Wrigley because I always have somebody being like, George, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I recognize faces and voices very, very quickly. I think it's one of those kind of OCD things that uh, <laughs> that some people have where I just, you know, whoever's talking to me or yelling at me, I, you know, I can pick it up quick and, and I know who it is. And, you know, going going and saying hello. And every time I play at Wrigley, I feel that I'm pitching not, not only for myself and for my team, but for everybody who has supported me along the way and who might be there or who might be watching on TV. You know, I feel like I always have my best stuff at Wrigley for that reason. There's always a little bit of an extra adrenaline whenever I'm pitching there. Um, just skipping to 18, uh, the back of your baseball card is so freaking weird that year, man. Um, what was it like? I know you've used the word, word uh, whirlwind quite a bit, uh, but I, that that's kind of what that year feels like. What was it like going through all that? It was it was tough um, for sure. It was one of those things where um, I wish that I wish going back in time I could know what I know now back then. And the only thing that I would do different is I would always for for a few years there I, I threw a lot of innings and a lot of games in those seasons. You know, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. I think I averaged sixty five games those three those three years, and then I would. Um, come back home and I would take 
it completely off for a full month to let the body recoup and obviously still stay physical, you know, go do some yoga, whatever, um, play some basketball, not basketball, go golfing, do whatever. But, um, that, what I, what I would have done differently is not taken so much time off. Cause I think what happened was I, I got myself into a few bad positions with my posture and my shoulder kind of rolled forward and I was dealing with impingement going into the 2018 season. So I was, I went into camp just a little bit behind schedule. And the only thing that was different was my velocity was a little bit down as opposed to being like 89, 92 or 90, 92 in screen training. I was more like 88, 90 that year. And it just took me a little bit of time to get it going. But by the time, you know, that stuff kind of happened. The, I had had a couple bad games, and, and the rest of the Pittsburgh bullpen, the young kids that they had were pitching really, really well, and I was just kind of the you know odd man out as far as you know who on the totem pole. So you know I got designated there, and then I went and signed with Cleveland, and I pitched really, really well for the you know 10 days or two weeks that I was in uh, – Columbus. I think I went 13 scoreless to start uh, my tenure with the Indians in AAA. And then I called up and I think I threw seven or eight innings and gave up two runs. But at that point, I was a new guy for them in their organization. And they were already kind of set. They had their guys there. And when a spot came again, I was the odd man out again. And it was just one of those kind of years where it was just, you know, nothing went well. And when I was pitching well, it didn't matter because, again, I was the low guy on the totem pole, regardless of what the back of the baseball card said or what I could do or what I could bring uh, versatility-wise to their bullpen. Um, you know, when you need a spot, the guy that you know the least or the guy that you think is the most expendable at that time is the one who goes, and that's just how it works in, in our game. So I understand it. It's just, uh, like I said, it, it was one of those things where it just was a, was a big whirlwind. And then I got uh, designated from... Uh, the Indians after pitching well, and then I got traded to the Yankees hmm. and then I got called back to the Yankees and got called up and I pitched against the Mets at Yankee stadium. I think I went one and two thirds and did really well. And then they needed a spot again. And then again, I was the, you know, odd man out. So it was just one of those, one of those years where it was just kind of a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, bumps in the road and, and um, kind of, adversity that you just got to keep your head on straight and put one foot in front of the other and just kind of get through it. Um, I know we're both hopeful that there's more big league time ahead for you, but if that last big league game is in a Yankees uniform, does it feel kind of fitting? You know, I've, I've, I've said that to a few people now that it, it's very fitting that I, that I, at this point in time, I've made my debut with the Yankees and my last outing with the Yankees. And, um, you know, if, if that's the way it ends, uh, you know, I'm, very, very comfortable, and I can look in the mirror, and I can say that I always left it on the field, and I've, I've always kind of put the work in, and I've always worked as hard as I could to make myself as good as I could be for um, for my craft and for doing my job, and, um, you know, the, uh, the ideal ending or riding off into the sunset would have been, you know, 12 to 15 years in the big leagues and all that, the perfect storybook ending, but how many people get to actually live out that that goal or that dream and and uh but but if it's the end then you know i'm i'm very comfortable looking in the mirror and say that i left it all on the table and 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 i can i can live with that yeah so last year you and i kind of ended up uh, reconnecting after things didn't work out with the cubs and i do have to ask you about that to kind of start out with um obviously the hometown team how how disappointing is it that things end up going the way they do with them it was definitely disappointing you know i, I think it was one of it was one of those things where you know um they came and watched, obviously, being in the backyard right here. You know, I had a couple of their um, staff come watch me throw, and, and, I, and I was throwing well. And, you know, at that point in time, they were just – they're trying to get as many people into camp that they can take a look at, you know, just in case. You always want to have options. You always want to have reinforcements, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, I, and I've never been a guy who goes into camp really and, you know – I, I've always been a build-up, regardless of how ready and game ready and how many times I've faced hitters before um, going into warm weather and, and getting into a scheduled, routine um, environment. You know, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a kind of like you know growing time that it takes to kind of get settled in. And um, you know, I had a couple a couple outings early there that that didn't that didn't go well, and you know, it was just a numbers thing. They had their guys that they 
that they liked and you know they were like look we're we don't see you making the team right now so i took my out and um you know ended up in the atlantic league in long island um it was one of those things last year where i saw your name heading to long island i was like oh that's awesome when i could see george and then there's part of me it's like holy shit what is george doing here i mean <laughs> what, what did you kind of because i've seen guys who haven't accomplished a third of what you have come in with a crappy attitude was it was it hard for you to kind of i guess have to almost swallow your pride in a sense and come down there for a little bit um i definitely fought it i definitely when i was talking to my agents i was like i i, I fell into that kind of thing for just for a little bit where I was like, look at the back of my baseball card, look at the back of my baseball card. Like, you know, why, why am I not getting an opportunity? And then finally my agents were like, look, you need to be throwing. You need to. And I was throwing, I was facing, I was facing hitters three times a week over at Northwestern during their practices. And we would go live, but and I was videotaping everything and I was doing everything that I was doing to try and get as much information out as I could. But finally my agents were like, look, you need to go there. If you pitch, Anywhere near how you're capable of pitching, you will not be there long. And I was like, all right, fine. So we went there, and the very first pitch I throw in my very first game was hit for a homer. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the it was in Sugar Land, and we were up by one in the ninth. I was closing the game. It was about my ninth. And uh, first pitch I gave up was a homer, and then I didn't give up another run for the whole time I was there. Were you, because uh, obviously I can't imagine you too much about indie ball, and especially going to Sugarland for the first time too, because that's obviously more of a triple A big league style setup there. Were you impressed or surprised by what indie ball actually was in your experiences there? Um, I I was pleasantly surprised, to be honest. It, you know, there were guys that were on my team, Kirk Neuenheis. I mean, that guy's gotten a couple hits off me in the big leagues. <laughs> um, so... I mean, Hector Sanchez was a battery mate of mine for five, four or five years uh, with the Giants. So it was, it was, I was definitely uh, pleasantly surprised to the competition level. I think that it was very competitive. Um, as far as, as far as, you know, the attitude and all that, I, I personally think, but for maybe once or twice in my career, I've always tried to, again, control what I can control, look at the positives, have a good time. You know, if I'm acting like a bum and acting kind of like a dickhead, you know, how does that make me look? What does that say about me? All I can do is put a positive attitude and, you know, control what I can control. And my effort and my attitude is all that I can maintain a positive on every single day. And I tried to do that. And um, I actually had a really fun time there, getting in, getting to know some of the guys there that I've played against in the big leagues um, who are really, really good guys. Now, now that I've come to be in the same locker room slash clubhouse with them, um, and it was refreshing, you know, it was, it was refreshing, you know, knowing that the next step above here is not the major leagues. It's, you know, somewhere else where I can just continue to play baseball. And I had a lot of fun and we, we had a good time with the guys and it was, um, you know, it was one of those things that, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I pitched well enough to only be there for two weeks, but it was definitely a time that I, that I also enjoyed. So. Yeah, Nationals grab you out of there pretty quickly. It seemed like that was a really good landing spot for you with what a, for lack of a better way of putting it, dumpster fire their bullpen, bullpen was at the time. Um, looking at your numbers and seeing the way you were throwing the ball in the Atlantic League, I got to see a couple of your addings for the Ducks Alive. I know that those, those numbers really weren't you. So, I mean, was that was that the PCL? Was that just wear and tear? I guess what, what was that towards the end of that season? So... Last year was the first year that they started using major league balls in AAA. And um, I think, you know, over the years, you've either seen or have absolutely heard that the PCL is slightly a launching pad because you play in places that have smaller ballparks and they're higher elevation. You know, El Paso, Texas, Albuquerque, um, you're in places where it's it's worse than playing in Colorado. Um, so the numbers were, were very skewed. I think I gave up, I think I threw like 55 innings and I gave up like 32 runs or something like that. And 16 of those runs came in four innings of work. Ugh. So I, you know, I made a, I made a spot start in Salt Lake city, uh, which is a very high altitude place, altitude, uh, place. And, um, I gave up six runs in one inning in a spot start there because we, the, the major league club had taken a couple of the starters from, uh, Fresno 
up to the nationals and they left us to do a bullpen series essentially. So it was just, everyone was kind of, um, <laughs> running amok and, and they were just scram They were scrambling, no fault of, of their own, but you know, it was just kind of thrust upon them and we had to cover it. And, um, you know, I, I, I felt that I actually pitched significantly better than those numbers. If you, if you take a dive deeper into those numbers, you can see that, um, it was just a handful of innings. And if you take those innings away, I have like a two nine in the PCL with major league balls, which is more the level of how I felt that I pitched. And at one point I went, you know, 16 or 17 scoreless innings, um, at the end of July, beginning of August. And that was when I really thought I was like, all right, you know what? I've hit my stride. I'm pitching as well as, you know, I've ever thrown low. You know, I started throwing a new curveball that had been really effective and I was locating everything. The, 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 the fastball had jumped up to like 92, 93. Um, but it just, you know, the call never came and it was one of those things where I definitely feel like I could have helped, but you know, they ended up winning the world series. So, yes. Um, I guess, you know, it's pretty obvious, like you said, that there's a lot of baseball left in the tank for you. Again, from from watching you, you know, you still still can pitch at the big league level, but I think a lot of folks have noticed that they haven't seen your name uh, pop up on, on a roster anywhere so far this, I guess, technically still an, an off season. So uh, what are the plans for, for George Contos going forward? Well, uh, you know, I, I was planning. I, I had, had done a lot of work. Um, this off season, I started throwing maybe two weeks after the season ended just to stay ready. And I was actually throwing with, uh, um, a fellow teammate of mine from the Fresno, uh, team, uh, with the nationals who, um, spent his off season in Chicago and we were working out together, throwing together. And I felt great. Um, I was talking to a few teams. I had even put out a, uh, one of those pitching ninja help me out tweets where, <laughs> where I, uh, you know, videoed everything and, and, and showed, showed everybody, uh, you know, where my stuff was at in bullpens. And, um, you know, once spring training rolled around and I had, I had had some communication with, with a few teams and nothing had happened. Um, you know, I decided that I think once, uh, once spring training started and, and nothing had happened, I, I think it was time to, I think, move on and, uh, turn the page and, um, you know, see what, uh, what the next chapter will bring. And, um, you know, I, I think I have that in, in my mind pretty embedded. I can't, I can't quite say what it's going to be yet until, um, it is formally announced, but, um, but there's, there's definitely something that I'm excited about on the horizon. And, um, um, it's, it's something that I'm very much looking forward to. So, uh, you'll, you'll be one of the first to know when, when it gets announced and, and maybe we can talk about it again, but at, at this point in time, I, I got to keep it a little hush hush. So if, if this is, it for their career when you look back are you and it's it's a stupid question to ask for a guy who's won two world series are you are you satisfied with the way everything has gone over the past i guess it would be what 14 years yeah 14 years um you know i i absolutely am like like i said the only the only thing that i didn't get to accomplish um you know is is kind of riding off into the sunset um having having my main goal, I think, was was I, I always wanted to hit 10 years. And there's obviously, um, you know, still opportunity to, you know, coach and, and be involved and, and on a major league staff where you can accrue some service time and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, the, the one goal that I did not attain was getting um, that 10-year that mark. Um, but other than that, like I said earlier um, in, our, in our chat, you know, I can look myself in the mirror and I can always say that, you know, I always gave it my best. I always left it all on the field or in the weight room or on, uh, you know, running, running the track or doing my conditioning. I've, I've always given it my best. And, um, you know, I can, I can look myself in the mirror and go to sleep at night, very comfortable and confident in my own skin saying that. So, um, not everybody gets that storybook ending. Like, uh, like some of these guys, uh, who hang them up after, you know, 12, 15 years and, and, uh, they spent them all with one team or they've had these, these long, great careers, um, you know, that's, that's the one thing that, uh, I, I would have liked to have done, but you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, things left and this next chapter I'm looking forward to very, very much. So that's kind of where, where I stand on everything. Well, Georgia, I'm not sure what the future holds for you. Maybe charging by the hour for podcast might be beneficial for you. Uh, I appreciate you taking uh, this long to chat, man. It, it was great catching up with you. You were always great to me when we were, were both kids. And now that we're both a little older, you've always still always taken time for me whenever I've asked. And I really genuinely do appreciate it, man. And whatever the future holds, uh, 
I know you'll do big, 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 big things, my friend. So uh, thanks again for the time. Uh, thanks for a hell of a career and entertaining us all, and I uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Oh, my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to chatting again soon. Sometimes I dream that he is me. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for listening to that and, and watching that. Um, I mean, I, I, I didn't... I didn't oversell it, did I? It was really good, wasn't it? It was really good. Glad we got to do that one. Uh, George is very, very generous with his time, as you could tell, and uh, a great storyteller as well. So uh, not sure what the future holds for him, um, but whatever it is, I'm sure it'll be uh, a pretty pretty fulfilling and fun endeavor for him uh, with uh, the great career he had. Whatever he's going to go on to do, it's, it's, it's going to be successful with that guy. There's no doubt about that. So... Uh, episode 22 coming up. Uh, it's our first non-Atlantic League guy, Eric Hacker. Uh, he's been a very popular media personality with everything going on in the KBO. Uh, came across Eric uh, when we were together in Trenton, I think 08, 09, one of those years. Kind of similar to, to the, things, uh, the way things went with George. Uh, Eric reached the big leagues with a couple of different teams, so we're going to get into that. We're going to get into a whole bunch of different things with him. But until then... Stay safe, stay inside, damn it, be good to each other, and don't be racist, because that's awful. Wash your damn hands, right here. And I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you so much for your support, guys. I do appreciate it, and I will see you all soon.